Here's Deciding Your Destiny with Dr. Cecil Stewart. Coming up on today's programme, Dr. Stewart brings a message entitled The Power of Proclamation. But first we bring you a testimony from Anna Sinclair. You're watching Deciding Your Destiny with Dr. Cecil Stewart. My testimony starts um, at the beginning, like everybody else's. Um, I was born into a family with four other, well, no, three other kids, so there was four of us. I was the oldest of four, so needless to say, I was very headstrong, um, very rebellious, um, and it was, it was interesting growing up. Um, you know, not everybody gets along with their siblings and with their parents, and um, me and my dad would be very different. I was more of a free spirit. He's very logical and, you know, direct. And so we, we had some conflict there. Um, there was a lot of conflict between me and him. And that really, um, really was a crucial thing in my life that was missing. Um, and I mean, you know what? Everybody has their own baggage and their own past and their own hurts that they're working through. And as a mother myself now of four kids, I'm realizing how much comes out of you when you're dealing with your kids that you didn't even know was there. And so my dad had a lot of his own baggage that he hadn't dealt with yet, and I was no easy child, for sure. Um, so there was a lot of conflict, and basically um, I grew up thinking I wasn't smart, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like him, I wasn't smart, book smart, and so I, in my head, it means I'm stupid. So I kind of went on a downward spiral in school. I just didn't bother trying anymore. I, thankfully, I graduated high school, but you know, I just didn't care. Like, I was at, when I was a teenager, I was at a point in my life where I didn't care. Um, <clears throat> Thankfully, my parents are saved. They, you know, they were praying for me. My grandmother was praying for me. And so God did have his hand on my life. And they did drag me to church. Um, we went to an Anglican church all my life, all my young life. Um, and I had experienced God. I knew he was real. I didn't have a doubt that he was real. And thankfully, he showed himself to me over the course of my young life and always reminded me that he was there. But being the very rebellious young girl I was, I was just like, no, I wanna do things my own way. And um, basically, it got to the point when I was finishing high school, um, where I come from, basically your life is almost laid out for you. You go to school, then you go to university, then you get a good job, and then you have your 2.4 kids, whatever that means, and then you work for the next 35 years of your life, and then you retire and do the fun things. Um, and so I had no idea what I wanted to do. I wanted to, well, I wanted to be a vet, I wanted to get into the army, I had like all these like, you know, and my parents really wanted me to go to university, they were, you know, but I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to take, and I thought, well, what's the point of going for four years and wasting all that money if I don't even know what I want to do? And they basically, and my attitude was awful. I was an awful influence. I was drinking and partying and sneaking out of my house, and they had no idea. <laughs> um, they were blissfully and ignorant of what I was getting up to. But really, in my heart, I was a very, very angry, angry person. You wouldn't think so. But I was extremely angry, just full of rage. You know, because we were very well disciplined when I was a, when I was a kid, and we weren't allowed to talk back. We weren't allowed to, you know, really say what we thought, or else, you know, you got soap in the mouth, or you were grounded, or whatever. And so I had a lot of pent up rage in my heart, and um, I was just a totally different person than who I am today. Totally different. And so basically all of that culminated into this kind of one year, my last year of high school, where my parents basically gave me an ultimatum and said, you either pick something in university and go, or we're kicking you out of the house. Um, and then uh, it just so happened that some friends of theirs from church, their daughter went to this thing called YWAM, or Youth with a Mission. It was, it's a missionary training uh, thing for young people. 
And so the, that was tacked on to the ultimatum, kind of a little further on. Um, and it absolutely terrified me because I didn't know, I didn't know what I wanted to do in university. Um, I didn't want to move out because where my parents live, it's really expensive. So I, I just terrified me. And I thought, well, really, my only option here is YWAM. You know, um, and I'd started dating this guy at the time, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to leave him. And I mean, he was not a good influence anyway. But I was basically at a crossroads. And I think, I mean, thank God for his mercy, right? Like, even when we're just that verse, even when we're so rebellious, when we don't even know him and we don't even care, Christ died for us, right? And so, in his mercy, he as well gave me an ultimatum. And he said, you can either keep going the way you're going, doing things your way, or you can try things my way. And as much as I was like, <laughs> I thought, well, what else, what else is there? You know, what have I got to lose? My parents are pulling their hair out and they're ready to get rid of me and, you know, even though they love me. Um, so I chose YWAM. And uh, so I applied, I, th I must have been in the autumn of 2000. Um, I got accepted for the winter school of 2001 in Hawaii, in Maui, not too bad. Um, <laughs> I know, suffering for the Lord in Maui. <laughs> um, and basically what, it, what this program was, was it was a six month school. So for two months you go and you basically get immersed in different topics like inductive Bible study, cross-cultural communication, the Father Heart of God, they have different speakers come. And then for the last two and a half months you go on an outreach to a third world country and you basically put into practice what you've learned and you go and spread the gospel. Um, and so when I, when I, I left in January of 2001 and it was all my parents could do to get me on that plane. I did not want to go. I was just resisting and resisting, but I knew in, in my heart, I knew I had to go. So I got on a plane, flew like over 5,000 miles to this little island in the middle of the Pacific. And you know, God is faithful. When you just take that step as hard as it can be, boy, does he ever meet you, doesn't he? And he met me there. And I ended up, I found out I was going to Uganda on my outreach for two and a half months, which was like a, actually a dream come true because I'd always watched the, you know, the, like the world vision with the little African kids. And I was like, even as a kid, I was like, oh, I'd love to go there and see those kids and all. And literally when I found out I was going to Uganda, I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And it's like, I just, like God met me there. And he literally, literally started that process of transformation. You know how Paul talks about, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word metamor it's a word metamorphosis, right? And we, both, we all know that the caterpillar doesn't turn into the butterfly straight away. It's a process. But my goodness, is it an amazing process. Hard, but r so good. And so that started my journey of healing, of forgiving of being forgiven um, and so I finished that school and I went home and I think my parents were like wow okay <laughs> like just so different and you know I think they had this idea in their head that okay she's going to come home and then she's going to get serious and go to university and all and um, that didn't happen when I was there I knew the Lord wanted me to come back so I said no I'm actually going to go back and volunteer on staff because <laughs> nobody gets paid everybody's a volunteer and they were like, ah, oh, right, okay. So that started a whole life. And I ended up uh, volunteering with YWAM for about four and a half years. I led, I led teams to the Philippines, to Thailand and Bali. I did a school of worship, um, a school of inductive Bible study. So just specifically on studying the Bible. Um, and I, it was a school of worship that ended up bringing me here. Um, my team came to Belfast for, it was only meant to be two weeks, but it turned into six uh, because our plans fell through in Scotland. We ended up getting connected with a church. We ended up staying, and I remember looking out onto the, onto the cave hill from the window of the flats we were staying in, and I remember the Lord saying, what would you think if I asked you to come here? And I was like, really? All right, I'll give it a year. You know? my, uh, my vision for my life was living on an island, doing surfing ministry, 
with young people and doing worship. I was thinking like Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, Tahiti. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I actually said before I left YWAM, so like my, in 2005, the start of 2005, when, I w when we were leaving here, I remember saying to the Lord, okay, I know my time with YWAM is almost done. I'm not sh quite sure what you want me to do, but I want to live on an island. I want to be able to surf. I want to do worship and I want to work with young people. I just didn't specify the temperature. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. Uh, because I was thinking like tropical island, right? Having lived in Maui for four and a half, well, on and off four and a half years. And um, so, uh, you know, but that, that kind of humorous and yet very serious note has actually sustained me through many years because I came over on my own. I was single. I was, uh, lived in Belfast for six years in a flat. And like there was a lot of times where I'm like, I am done. I'm going home. I'm fed up. I'm sick of this, you know. And it was that reminder that the Lord said, ah, but I've given you what you've asked for. I'm like, Ugh, dang it, you know, so be, be careful what you ask for, <laughs> you know, but thank God, because this is home now, this is, you know, this is where my heart is, and, um, and I'm just in awe of how God can change a life, you know, and how, I mean, it's, it's almost cliche, the, the, the way Christians kind of throw it around, but how deep the Father can go to the depths to reach and save a person, over and over and over and over again. You know, he is so faithful because he knows our hearts. He's so faithful to just pull us back up again, you know? And I think, what a heavenly father. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're all still in a process. I'm still in a process of being healed and, and all this stuff, but my goodness, this is freedom. Isn't it? Isn't this freedom? Like knowing Jesus and like that, I love that song, being called out of the grave, being called out of that tomb into his marvelous light, you know, and there will be darker days, but he's, his light never goes out, you know, and we are the light of the world and we are the salt of the earth. And it's just like we're, like he's given us his power. We are powerful. And we need to learn to believe that. We are not in ourselves, but in him. We are powerful. And the word, when it's in our mouths and in our hearts, wow, can change atmospheres, can change people, can change places. So there you go. You're watching Deciding Your Destiny with Dr. Cecil Stewart. But I want to ask you to give me your attention for just a short time this evening. And I have a theme, I believe, the Lord has given me. It's entitled, The Power of Proclamation. None of us realize how powerful our words are. The power of proclamation. When we proclaim Jesus as Lord, we are totally transformed. In fact, that's what it says all of us know the scripture in Romans 10 and 9 that if we believe in our hearts, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we are saved. With the heart you believe or with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There's a powerful scripture in Isaiah 52, just to refer briefly to it. Verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, notice the word, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. We are those people. It's our feet everywhere you go every day. You're carrying that good news. Your feet are beautiful. Your word is transforming because you have the word in you. And if you don't have the word in you, the good news is you can have it in you tonight. And you may want to take notes of some of these scriptures I'll mention very quickly tonight because they're 
quickened and they're alive. Also in Luke chapter 4, 18 through 22, Jesus made a proclamation and it brought tremendous change. He proclaimed, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of God's favor. And so, just as Jesus stood up that day and made a proclamation, so we today have the same message, the same word, the same anointing, and he sent us forth to proclaim good news. Amen? The enemy is broadcasting his evil news every day. We all know the power of proclamations that are given that stir up hatred. We can think about it in history, people like Hitler and Idi Amin. We walked the streets of Uganda many times when we were there for missions. And we saw, as we drove through the area, where people who took us around showed where there was people lying dead every morning that were killed because of the direction of this evil man. Evil people speaking evil words can stir up destruction and death. But we are the people of God and we have good news to proclaim. So let's not be silent when the world is short of good news. The power of proclamation is so marvelous. We went to Rwanda also years ago and we had a mission there and saw thousands of people attending the meetings, thousands coming forward to give their lives to Christ. Miracles happened, transformation happened. But then we were taken by some folks who were guiding us in the region and they took us to the area where the awful massacre happened, where 800 people plus were killed because of the hatred and division that was stirred up between the Hutsis and Tutsis. And it brought great grief to see that spot where they were murdered. But then after that's over, the word of life still works. And God in his mercy is reaching the people that are hurt and the relatives of those that lost loved ones. His word works when we proclaim it, but if we're silent, then nothing happens. Last month we were in Italy. We were privileged to minister with a church there and we saw every single night people responding for salvation, for assurance of salvation. As we proclaimed the word, faith arose, the atmosphere was charged with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we know the reality of the power of proclaiming. And the enemy would like to silence us, but it's good for us to do what we heard Anna do tonight, share the transformation that's happened in our lives. And when one person is transformed, they can bring transformation to hundreds and thousands. If you keep proclaiming day after day, the power of that word keeps going on and on, changing lives. So as Jesus spoke here in Luke chapter 4, notice what he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then it says, because... Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent him, he was sent to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, whatever kind of captivity, 
recovering of sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, the acceptable year of God's favor. This is the same message. Then Jesus said, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He, in other words, he was saying, I am now stepping out, fulfilling what was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. We are stepping out in this day, fulfilling the word of the Lord that in the last days, God will pour his spirit upon all flesh. Amen? Amen. How many know it's not going to end up in defeat? It's going to end up in victory. Yes. Amen. Give the Lord a bit of a hand and shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. We received an unusual testimony recently. Uh, some of you who watch our program, it's called Deciding Your Destiny on different channels. We, we also, by the way, would appreciate your prayers for the programs going out in Italy. We are on four different stations. We made 17 programs in two and a half days last month. Romulo came over and we did that. And we had amazing testimonies. One was a man who was in prison, who saw the program in prison. And it brought light and hope and changed his life. And he was born again. The later report was that there was seven, 16 or 17 baptized in water in the prison who'd come to faith through the word of the Lord. And Romulo goes in there regularly and brings literature. These hope builders which we mentioned, they are translated into Italian and they're going into the prisons, they're going all over the place. And people are coming to Christ in the prisons. Wherever you proclaim the word, transformation happens. Amen. If you take it as God's word. But we had an unusual testimony at the office. Paul is here tonight and she knows the detail, but basically it was something like this. A man who is a lecturer in University of Notre Dame and his son was very ill. His teenage son was suffering with a cancerous tumor on his back and he was very ill and his father was concerned deeply concerned but one night he had a dream and the dream said to him contact Holly Graham and he didn't know who's Holly Graham then he put it out of his mind but a couple of nights later he dreamed again contact Holly Graham He then went to search to find who Holly Graham was and discovered that Holly was making some announcements on our program. She was mentioning the Hope Builders, she was mentioning the various literature which we make available. So Holly Graham was working at the time with us. And so he'd come across our program, CCN, and watched it, heard about healing, heard about miracles that had happened to us, heard about hope, when there's no hope. And so he contacted us to pray, and we prayed, and there were many others praying. We prayed for his son. We got an email just a matter of a week or so ago saying his teenage son is completely healed, totally healed by the power of God. To God be the glory. And I believe we're coming into a new season where miracles are going to be the order of the day. We have tolerated the enemy too long. People have lived with depression, lived with anxiety, but it's time for us to realize that when Jesus died on the cross, he dealt with the depression, he took the thorns in his head, the nails in his hands, so our mind is no longer subject to depression. We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, amen? 
Statistics just the other day that came to me says that 4,783 people in Northern Ireland have committed suicide between the year 2000 and 2018. That's more people than died through the whole time of the Troubles, which lasted over 30 years. And I believe it's time for us to start proclaiming over Newton Abbey, over Belfast, over every town, over our family, we start to proclaim suicide has no power over us. In the name of Jesus, we break the power of depression. We break the power of anxiety. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord of our lives, of our families, and he is not in any way subject to the bondages, nor either are we if we proclaim what God says. We'll say amen. When we were in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, a young man came to the meeting and told one of the team, he said, I've lost my job, I've no hope, and I'm going to commit suicide. He'd given up hope. I don't remember the detail of how, but he was prayed with. And that young man went home, and in a matter of days, he was offered a job in a bank. He came to faith and had a job by the power of the word. Proclamation of hope lifts people above their struggles and disappointments, and we don't know how much power we've got. Let's proclaim it, amen? amen. Let's speak it out, and let's declare over our family we're blessed. You're watching Deciding Your Destiny with Dr. Cecil Stewart. There are various ways you can watch our Deciding Your Destiny TV program on TV, online, and on demand. Be sure to check out these free resources available for you today. You're watching Deciding Your Destiny with Dr. Cecil Stewart. information on today's program, contact us today, CCN 547 Antrim Road, Belfast, County Antrim, Northern Ireland, BT 15 3BU, telephone 02890 779 552, email ccn at ccnorg.com, check us out on Facebook and YouTube and visit our website ccnorg.com.